Great. Well, first of all, thanks um, to the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's really an honor to be asked to present the keynote at Open Repositories. Um, this is a meeting that I attend almost every year and it's, it's one of the most important conferences in our field. So I'm really grateful to be here. Um, of course, <laughs> like Sarah, I'd rather be in the beautiful city of Stellenbosch enjoying the amazing views and partaking in the delicious wine. Um, and most of all, engaging, discussing and socializing with you um, colleagues. And I very much hope that next year we will be again back in person. Um, today I'm Zooming from Montreal, Canada, uh, where the lockdown is slowly beginning to ease. Uh, spring has come and we're starting to feel a slight note of optimism here. So I'll try to infuse some of this optimism in, in my talk today. Dear colleagues, friends, most of you are friends. We are, we are really living in unprecedented times. We're living in a moment of history, a moment that is really going to test our, our collective resilience. And crises like this pandemic uh, expose the cracks and weaknesses in our societies and systems. How we look after our elderly, inequalities in healthcare, bad governance, and so on. And, and the deficiencies of scholarly communications have been in full view during this pandemic. Um, slow processing times between submission to publication, paywalls, lack of transparency of peer review, and so on. These issues are just simply unacceptable when they're measured up against the seriousness of fighting a global pandemic. While they were irritating and distasteful in the past, the problems are now unacceptable. But sometimes also in difficult times like this, with weaknesses in full view, we're forced to reassess our current assumptions, to revisit things that we've taken for granted, and to look at the world through a different lens. I know I'm personally questioning the sanity of living with a 14-year-old teenager under lockdown. <laughs> Who knew you could expend so many calories and be so hungry by playing video games all day? Um, but professionally also, um, you know, take open access. This pandemic has illustrated so clearly, so unequivocally why we need open access and open science. If we are to understand this disease, to develop effective treatments, and ultimately we so desperately hope find a vaccine, we need rapid and open sharing of research outputs. So let's hope this experience will settle the open access debate once and for all. But today I'd like to talk about another set of foundational principles. Uh, let me change my slide here. Um, that have not garnered the same amount of attention as open, um, but I think are equally as important. And those are the principles of diversity, inclusion, and equity in scholarly communications. Diversity, inclusion, and equity matter, most of all because in a moral sense, each person has intrinsic value and should have the right to participate in our systems. But for other reasons as well, um, as the pandemic has demonstrated, we're really all in this together. Our societies and economies are intricately, intricately connected. And the problems of one region, group, domain, will have an impact on everyone else. We are not living in a zero sum game situation, but we are living in a highly integrated and connected global world. So it's in all of our interests that the scholarly communication system works for everyone. And there's another reason, because research will simply be better if it is inclusive, diverse, and equitable. In his book um, called The Difference, How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Societies, Scott Page argues that diversity trumps ability when it comes to problem solving, as different perspectives can come at a problem in different ways, leading to greater innovation.
So the way we achieve diversity, inclusive, inclusivity, and equity in scholarly communications is through something we're calling bibliodiversity. What we need is a system or systems that will accommodate different workflows, languages, publication outputs, research topics that support the needs and pluralism of different research communities and different societies. Um, so bibliodiversity was a term that was coined by a group of Chilean publishers in the 1990s. And they're really talking about the diversity of products of monographs of books that are available to, to readers. And then the term was taken up later, more recently, um, by the Call de Jésus, which was launched in 2017 by a group of French organizations. And the Jésus Call argues that open access must be complemented by support for diversity in scientific uh, and scholarly publishing. And I think the aim of that call was really to raise awareness and get the community talking about the dangers of the growing concentration of publishers and uh, you know, the predominance of the APC model that is so often discussed, um, which it really could further entrench those dominant players in the system. So building on these earlier discussions um, in March this year, several colleagues and I published a paper that discusses the current state of bibliodiversity and calls on the community to take action. And that's really going to be the center of, of my talk today. So why is bibliodiversity important? Well, if you think about diversity, it is an important characteristic of any healthy ecosystem. As I said earlier, bibliodiversity is essential for addressing the complex problems and challenges we face. The authors of this um, blog, this Len um, London School of Economics blog, argue that diversity of academic content, both at the national and international level, is essential for preserving research in a wide range of global and local topics. Study from different epistemic and methodological approaches inspired by various schools of thought and expressed in a variety of languages. So what is the current state of bibliodiversity right now? Well, unfortunately, it's been in decline for several decades. If we can equate biodiversity with bibliodiversity, um, the scholarly communication system is definitely not a tropical rainforest at the moment. And of course, rainforests are areas of extremely high biodiversity but rather um, the current system is more appropriately represented by this, this picture of a deforested field in Madagascar. And you know, for many years, we've heard from our colleagues in developing countries about major, major inequalities in the currently scholarly publishing system. Um, this was a slide from the keynote speaker at Open Repositories in Dublin in 2016. I think, I believe she was from South Africa and the whole topic of her presentation was about how unbalanced the system is, especially for the global south. Um, this image, which was created by Juan Pablo Alperin at Simon Fraser University, shows us clearly the dominance of the current system by authors in mainly the US and, and East, uh, Western Europe. And then of course we see the rise of China. So this data is from 2017, but I, I believe now um, uh, since 2019, China has surpassed the US in terms of number of publications. And I think it's important to note that this map is based on data from Scopus. So it only includes the publications that are available in the Scopus database. And I'm gonna address this issue a little bit later on in my talk. So indeed, far from promoting diversity, the dominant ecosystem 
of scholarly publishing today increasingly resembles what Vandana Shiva has called the monocultures of the mind. Um, and this is characterized by homogenization of publication formats and venues really that are increasingly owned by a small number of multinational publishers who are more interested in profit maximization than, than the health of the system. And um, we discuss in our paper several highly interconnected factors that are really contributing to the decline in bibliodiversity. Uh, the prominence of the English language, increasing consolidation of infrastructures, limited funding models, and our research evaluation systems. And I'm just going to take you quickly through, through each of these one by one. So um, the first factor is the predominance of English, the English language. Um, you know, if everything is published in English, it does not reflect, it cannot reflect the variety of local, regional, international, intercultural practices in different disciplines and different research communities. But many researchers around the world are obliged to publish in English even if it is not their first language or their preferred language. According to this article in, in Inside uh, Higher Ed by um, Mary Jane Curry and Theresa Lillis, there were about 27,000 journals in the web of science in 2018, and most of them are, are in English. Um, at, in the meantime, there are about 9,000 other peer-reviewed journals in, in other languages. Um, but most of these non-English journals are not in the major indexes. And that means they're considered less legitimate. Um, it means that the research published in those journals is often overlooked. And in some extreme cases, publishing in non-English journals is equated incorrectly with publishing lower quality content. And this is, is such a crucial issue because when researchers publish in English, uh, the public and their societies in non-English countries cannot make use of that research because it's not published in their own language. So the Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism in Scholarly Communications argues that um, the disqualification of no, uh, local and national languages in academic publishing is the most important and often forgotten factor that prevents societies from using and taking advantage of research done where they live. And then there's another aspect as well. It introduces um, significant biases in the system because non-native speakers obviously naturally will have a more difficult time articulating and explaining their research in English. So while the dominant position of English is useful for widespread dissemination and sharing of ideas across the, wor the world, it can also impede the use and adoption of research results at the local level. And a, a good scholarly communication system re really needs to support these two different elements. So the second factor is the, the growing consolidation of um, uh, infrastructures and services in the hands of a few large companies. Um, bibliodiversity really requires a variety of open infrastructures and services around the world, a network of community driven infrastructures localized and serving the needs of different communities. But for decades now, we have been witnessing mergers and acquisitions of large publishing companies. Um, in 2015, Vincent Larivière and his colleagues reported that the top five publishers control about 50% of the market, or they did then, and, about se and above, 75 per, uh, above 70 percent for some disciplines. And I think that's probably even higher now. Um, more recently, these same companies have been expanding their investments, uh, buying up other types of services in attempts to capture really the whole life cycle of research. Um, I did a, a quick Google search um, with the names of some of the publishers followed by the word acquires. 
and you can see um, what comes up with those Google searches for Elsevier, for Wiley, for Taylor and Fa Francis. These companies have been very, very busy. And of course, these types of acquisitions lead to really increasing homogenization of the system. You know, not to mention price increases. Um, I think the issue of diversity of services and infrastructures is also related to who owns and controls these services. So it's not just about having diversity of services, it's diversity of the people who own and control them. Um, scholarly communication services really should be governed by the communities they serve. Their functionalities and developments should be based on the needs of those communities rather than being driven by profit motivations. Um, which brings us to our third factor, which is um, how the limited funding models that are in place really inhibit, um, inhibit us as a community from directing funds towards other types of, of services. So there's a lot of money in scholarly publishing. Um, this weekend, I had an email exchange with Claudio Aspesi. Uh, many of you have, might have heard of him. He's a long time analyst of, of the scholarly publishing market and now does consulting work for Spark. And, and he values the current academic journal market uh, uh, at about 10 to 11 billion US dollars a year. So that's really quite substantial. And um, of course, much of this funding comes from our institutions through libraries and library consortia, or in some case governments, which uh, purchase journals through big deal packages via multi-year licenses. And um, any of you who've been involved in, in negotiations with uh, publishers know that each time you go up for an, uh, a renegotiation, the, the cost, the price increases and the size of the package increases. Um, so it ends up taking up every time you renegotiate, you're spending a greater portion of your library budget on these big deal packages, um, which means that you end up decreasing funds for smaller, more diverse services, which again, again become further marginalized. So as we move to open, I feel we still don't have good robust funding models to support a diversity of open access and open science services. And there's a kind of reluctance uh, by the community to embrace models that are, you know, shall we say non-transactional, so not pay to publish or pay for access. But we really need these kind of non-transactional funding models to support uh, a range and diversity of, of services and infrastructures. So I, I think because of this, the most visible strategy for advancing open access um, via you know, our funding models is to flip the large publishers through our subscription deals to open access by paying APCs. And certainly this will increase the amount of open content available, but I don't think it's gonna help the situation with bibliodiversity and it actually may have a negative effect on, on diversity by decreasing um, uh, the amount of funding that's available for smaller services, open infrastructures. Um, they might just get squeezed out. So I think that's why um, we have seen uh, some publishers and platforms um, uh, express concern about this. Uh, you may have seen some of these blog posts or, or publications by Redelic in Latin America that has been very outspoken about this issue, and rightly so, I believe. Um, CORE in 2015 was already concerned about this issue, and, and we published a joint statement with UNESCO warning about the dangers of the move to a predominantly APC model of scholarly publishing. Um, and I think this, this point has not garnered as much attention as it should have. 
so far, um, but we're starting to see it creep into to the discourse, um, certainly the library discourse. And I'd like to point you to some comments that were made by a US librarian, Paige Mann, who, who posed some, some questions on the scholarly communication list related to this in, in March. And, and the, the context was, you know, we know there's going to be budget, an impact on our um, subscription budgets, on our um, acquisition budgets. How should we address this in our, in our licensing? Do we flip our budgets so that we prioritize independent and learned societies and leave what remains to, uh, in our budgets to the large commercial publishers? Do we proactively reach out to Diamond Publishing, OA publishers, and ask if they need library support? So I'm happy to see that this is starting to become part of the discourse. And I think we can look to our, our French colleagues for some leadership in this area. Um, they have been uh, leading the discussions around bibliodiversity and um, as we say in English, they have started to put their money where their mouths are. Um, recently in March, they announced that they will be investing 450,000 euros in, in three open infrastructures, for example. Of course, they also have very good national and, and local infrastructure that's publicly funded in France. Um, of course, this is probably still only a very small portion uh, of what is being spent on licenses with publishers in France, but it's definitely a good start. So we definitely need more funding directed at infrastructures and services to support diversity and a healthy ecosystem. And the fourth factor I think is probably the most important one as it, it has an influence on the other three and that's this um, emphasis, this ongoing emphasis on publishing in uh, prestige journals. This whole thing really hinges on research evaluation. There's so much pressure on researchers around the world to publish in high impact journals. Journals that are usually, for the most part, based in the North, but journals that now decide what research is valuable and what research is important. If we look at um, this slide, uh, the, uh, which shows you the criteria for the world university rankings, 50% of, of their assessment criteria are based on citation data in Scopus. So if you publish your journal, a journal in a journal that's not in Scopus, if you post a preprint, if you share your research data, you are essentially invisible in this ranking system and it's the same way for, for the other ranking frameworks. So this forces researchers to seek popular topics that will be of interest to the prestigious journals, not uh, to look at what's of greatest importance or relevance to them, their local communities and, and their societies. And, you know, to put it bluntly, and simply, this is just a thinly veiled modern day form of colonialism. It forces researchers around the world to play the game. And that game is defined by the values of the North. And yet we know um, that this situation continues despite significant evidence that there's only a tenuous correlation between prestige of a journal and the quality of the articles. Um, and impact of the articles um, that they publish. In addition, I think it's important for us to remember that uh, this emphasis on journals is also slowing down our progress around open science or sometimes called open scholarship because there are no strong incentives for researchers to share there are other types of, of, of research outputs like data. You know, so it's kind of a, all a vicious circle. Researchers have to publish in high impact journals to be recognized. They need to publish in English and therefore, you know, international journals that are indexed in the major indexes. 
Um, these journals can then demand high astronomical prices for subscriptions and APCs, which in, ten, in turn redirects funding away from, from smaller, diverse infrastructures, journals, and platforms. And of course, this vicious circle uh, feeds right into the hands and, and the pockets of the big publishers. So what can we do about this? This is where our call for action comes in. We need to raise awareness of the issue of, of bibliodiversity. And I think there's some urgency. We need to start to take immediate steps to address the problem. So we made a number of recommendations in our call to action in our paper. You're welcome to go and read it. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them because I don't have the time, but I'm going to mention the ones that I think are most important. Um, and there are six, six of them. So number one, we call on funders and institutions to endorse the Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA, and begin to reform their research evaluation systems, thinking about diversity as a key aspect. Number two, we call on libraries and library consortia and associations to develop alternative funding models that allow them to more easily invest in diverse content and services, including open infrastructure. Number three, we call on infrastructure providers, let me change the slides, um, to adopt community governance models. Number four, we call on policymakers to include bibliodiversity as an underlying principle in the context of their open science and open access policies. Number five, we call on researchers to use open and community-based infrastructures. And number six, we call on all stakeholders to work together to develop coordinated strategies that align policies, funding, incentives, and infrastructures in order to support diversity in scholarly communication. So, we have published this call for action and now we will begin to work on some strategies to advance these conversations with different stakeholders, communi stakeholder communities and in different venues. And we will definitely keep the community apprised on um, these strategies. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention repositories at an open repository conference. So where do repositories fit in all of this? Well, I mean, I would argue they are an extremely important part of a diverse scholarly communication system. We don't know for sure how many repositories or how many open research repositories there are, but there are at least 5,000, if not more. And these repositories provide access to a wide variety of different research types, of different types of research outputs. And they're also very localized. So they're well placed to respond to the needs of their communities. Now, repositories have been criticized over the years. Um, and I am acutely aware of this. They've been criticized for being clunky, not user friendly, using out of date technologies, not visible, not prestigious. And I think we as a community need to respond to these criticisms, address these criticisms head on. Um, so at CORE, we have been working over the last several years to try to address these issues and criticisms and chart a new course for repositories, a course that places them more at the center of scholarly communications. In 2017, November 2017, we published the first Next Generation Repositories report, which was the result of widespread community consultation, as well as developed through significant input from um, a group of, of, of experts. 
And the report identified new behaviors and several new technological recommendations for repositories. Last year, we published the PubFair conceptual model, which builds on the foundation of the next generation repository recommendations and further articulates some innovative services that could add value to the distributed repository network. And then the third document here is what we're working on right now at the moment. Um, it's a model for overlay journals using activity streams and linked data notifications. And this model will identify, will describe what is needed to build um, overlay peer review services for distributed repository records and will essentially help us to eliminate um, this green gold distinction that tends to kind of marginalize repositories in some communities. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. We'll be sharing the model first with an internal expert group and then hopefully in late June or early July, we will publicly share it with the community for your, for your input. And I think, you know, with some relatively small resource investments in new technologies for repositories and the development of new innovative value added services, we have the potential to transform scholarly communications. And this, you might recall, it was the original vision for repositories. But all of this requires collaboration. It requires stepping out of our silos, of our institutional silos, and leveraging the entire repository network in a very strategic way. You know, one of the competitive advantages that we have uh, in the repository community is that we um, are not in competition like the publishers are. We can collaborate and work together. And um, that's where we see um, our role at CORE, is to ensure that there's some common level of behaviors and interoperability across the repository network so that we can support this duality of the system, local, uh, local services and global interoperability. And this will allow us to advance this vision and um, start to implement a more expanded and active role for repositories. So in conclusion, just as with biodiversity, we cannot sit back and ex expect bibliodiversity to thrive on its own. It won't happen. Designing a system that fosters bibliodiversity while also supporting research at the international level will be extremely challenging. It means achieving a careful balance between unity and diversity, international, local, and careful coordination across the whole system. And we need to be careful because the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic could really further decrease the diversity in scholarly communications as institutions and funders' um, budgets become very squeezed. On the other hand, we can use this as an opportunity to raise awareness of this issue and develop an expectation across our communities that diverse platforms and journal, platforms, journals and repositories are, are beneficial and essential. Um, so since we are supposed to be in South Africa, I'd like to end my talk by invoking the great Nelson Mandela. On, on May 10th, 1994, Nelson Mandela made his inaugural presidential speech <clears throat> where he referred to the term rainbow nation. And through his strength, fortitude and empathy, Nelson Mandela led South Africa out of apartheid and laid out a vision of an inclusive and diverse society in which all South Africans could participate, regardless of gender, regardless of race, a diverse nation, a rainbow nation. But a rainbow nation does not evolve on its own without the right public policies and resource allocation. And nor can diversity in scholarly communications thrive without the appropriate care, without significant intentionality, so we don't know what our world will look like when we come out the other side of this pandemic, but we can try to make it a better, more diverse and inclusive place for research and scholarly communications. So let's get to work. Let's build 
a rainbow nation for scholarly communications. Thank you.